Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this month's webinar, Digital Strategies for Today's Fundraising Landscape. My name is Pearl Hoagland, and I am the Senior Program Manager for the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, a couple notes. This webinar will be conversational, with the opportunity to ask questions after the webinar during a Q&A session. Please submit any questions you have in the questions box using your GoToWebinar control panel. In the days following the webinar, you will receive an email with a slide deck and recording, recording to review again at your own leisure. You've got a cause? Learn how to fund it. At the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, we enhance fundraisers' skills so they can develop and sustain donor relationships to advance their cause in today's growing giving landscape through a proven contemporary curriculum presented by world-class nonprofit leaders, best-in-class faculty, and renowned philanthropists. We'd like to take a moment to recognize our important affiliate partners who provide training and education to fundraisers nationally. Check out the map to find an institute in your community. And if you are on social media, please give us a shout out using the hashtag SIPWebinar and tag us. Now I am pleased to introduce today's presenter, Francisco Martinez, trainer for the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. Francisco is an educator, speaker, and professional marketing consultant. With over 18 years of authentic leadership and marketing experience, Francisco has extensive knowledge in developing, implementing, and directing comprehensive marketing and communication strategies for small to enterprise level brands. Welcome Francisco and thanks for being here. Francisco, you are on mute. Sorry, just give us one second to troubleshoot and make sure we can hear our presenter. Hello everyone, sorry about that. Uh, thanks Pearl for the uh, invention of having some computer issues here. I'm more frustrated that you can't see my, my face. I put a suit for everyone. So if you just want to imagine this gentleman in the jungle looking um, looking dapper, um, I'd appreciate it. So that's that was a joke. So, um, so yeah, so I've been a trainer um, for since 2000. Uh, 12 with this issue of uh, philanthropy, so I'm happy to be here and help you get started. We do have a lot of information to go through today, so I wanted to start with a poll. And the question is, have you conducted a peer to peer campaign? It's no, yes, once, yes, we do them often. What is a peer to peer campaign or other? A poll is going to launch on your screen in just a minute. We'll give you about 10 seconds to select your results. All right, let's see what we have. <clears throat> Francisco, can you see the results on your screen? 
Yeah. You know what's funny is they seem to not have appeared on my screen. Here we go. All right. So it looks like the majority said no, they have not conducted a peer to peer campaign, with yes once being the next at 26%. Yes, we do them often at 23%. And then 21% said, what is a peer to peer campaign? Thank you so much. So we will cover that in the presentation. I think it's helped team how deep I need to go in certain, certain sections of what we're going to be covering, today, which is to discover why online fundraising is vital to your organization's long-term fundraising strategy, objective to explore how to position your organization, to stand, stand out to prospects and donors on social media. Three is to cultivate peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and activate current stakeholders. And four is to improve data analytics to measure and report on the impact of your digital fundraising initiatives. So why online fundraising? So it really expands reach. I think we all understand that. It's easy access of donations with minimum fees. Um, that's really changed over the last couple of years to become more affor affordable to collect donations uh, online. Number three is anytime access to fundraising progress. Number four is add personality to your cause. And number five, it is safe for donors. So a lot of reasons um, to up your online fundraising efforts. I want to start with your positioning statement and why it's important. So a strong positioning statement differentiates you from other organizations. It helps you stand out to donors and prospects. It gives your donors and stakeholders tools to talk about your organizations to others highlights the unique features and benefits of your organization and it outlines your organization's future direction. I will give you a really good example of a, a mission statement versus a positioning statement and then how this nonprofit specifically um, manipulates the positioning statement to fit the, the initiative they're working on. So the key components of a, a positioning statement is, is it is not your mission statement, but it does flow from it. It's both long-term and strategic, and everything your organization does should flow from your positioning statement. It also informs your organization's voice and tone, which is what we're going to get into. Just to, to frame where we're going here, you know, the step number one is to explain, okay, you know, a positioning statement is needed. It's different from your missioning, mission statement, and I want to set up, you have to know the difference between your voice and tone of your brand. So if you ask yourself right now, if I were to ask you, what's what's the difference between a, a voice and a tone? And do you know yours for your organization? The majority of, of folks that uh, I trade do not. And so there's an example of like why this has to be a progression from explaining there needs to be a positioning statement, a statement from your mission statement, explaining voice versus tone, and then we're going to go into the need for personas and how that translates into peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So there's just a, a roadmap of, of why I'm doing it this way. So, um, positioning statements, voice, and tone, the critical part of your messaging architecture uh, and a brand voice and the differences, of which I spoke to the difference between the voice and the tone. Brand voice describes your organization's personality, um, it's consistent and unchanging. So, some examples of a uh, brand voice would be um, a friendly, uh, playful, warm, professional, inspiring. Uh, complex uh, things like that, and the tone is emotional inflection that's uh, applied to your voice. And so, um, example of that is empowering and uplifting is a tone. It's friendly yet informative. Is a tone professional and ambitious? Is a tone um, you know far out in another galaxy it could be a tone. And so, it's an emotional inflection that's applied to your voice. So, it adjusts to what's suitable for a particular piece, uh, uh, persona, or, and or message. And so. Example of your brand voice is uh, professional and ambitious. Let's just say that um, your tone may be more colloquial uh, on uh, Instagram than it is on LinkedIn, or on Twitter, it may be more uh, fast paced, conversational than it is on Facebook or LinkedIn. So, there's an example of how the tone needs to change versus your uh, platform. So, speaking of platform, the next slide would be. It is uh, pervasive. Your organization's positioning statement, as well as voice uh, tone, touch every part of your digital brand. So this website, 
your landing pages, your email marketing campaigns, your peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, and your social media as far as it needing to be pervasive. And so I want to give an example um, that I promised of. Hey, Francisco, before you keep going, it looks like our audio is not um, doing so well. So we're just going to quickly troubleshoot everyone on the webinar. We were going to quickly troubleshoot and we'll be sure that our audio is improved. I apologize. Give us just one second. I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. It looks like we have Francisco back on. So he is going to reshare his screen and we can keep going. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Sure. So we are, I ended with that your voice and tone and your position seen is pervasive in every part of your um, digital brand. So we have the website, landing page, email marketing campaign, peer to peer and social media. I did want to show an example of a mission statement, uh, a positioning statement and how an organization, a nonprofit uses that. So here you'll see on the left is Goodwill is their mission statement. So good, Goodwill works to enhance the dignity and quality of life of individuals and families by strengthening communities, eliminating barriers to opportunity and helping people in need reach a full potential through learning and the power of work. And so I, I would imagine every leader, uh, employee, uh, staff member can can regurgitate their mission state, uh, their, uh, yeah, their mission statement. But their positioning statement is giving hope to individuals and families, helping them reach their full potential through education work and by giving them a hand up, not a hand out. And so they have pivoted their mission statement to a positioning statement and they use this positioning statement that's pervasive on, on the messaging they're working on. And I'll go back to their website. So their messaging that they're currently working on is here on the right side and their purpose there, local good goodwills are nonprofits that help overcome challenges to build skills find jobs and grow their careers, hashtag power of work. You need help finding a job, your local goodwill can provide. So that here is a campaign, obviously the hashtag campaign of uh, finding a job and goodwill. So what they did is they took their um, purpose, excuse me, their positioning statement, which I just show on the other screen and use that to do messaging. And so when we go back to the slide there, as far as pervasiveness, this is how the last you know, three slides in, in regard to what I was talking about, a positioning statement, the key components of it, that it's not your mission statement, it's different, it's critical, and you have to define your organization's tone and voice, and then make it pervasive and specific to what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's a website, landing page, your email marketing, peer-to-peer, -peer, or social media. So that is that. So we're moving on from the need for a positioning statement into peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And we're gonna tie in how voice and tone positioning statement um, translate into peer-to-peer -peer and then going into personas. So I know the majority of you aren't that familiar from the um, whole 
with peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. And so in short, it's a platform that allows other people to raise funds for your organization. So they, they an example would be, um, I think the majority of people that I train are familiar with Facebook and uh, birthday campaign. So it's my birthday. So instead of a gift or giving me money, I would like you to donate to this nonprofit. So there's an example of a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Obviously, those are usually smaller. Unless you're a celebrity, um, the birthday money isn't going to uh, you know, really uh, change, change the, your financials. But if you get enough individuals doing birthday camp, uh, campaigns, that can uh, be a game changer for you. So it doesn't have to be a, a large initiative. It can be just getting those uh, those small amount of people to give. And when I say small, small amount, that's relative. So 90% uh, of millennials uh, said they've been willing to give uh, through a peer-to-peer -peer campaign to raise money for uh, an organization, 90% of Gen Xers and 80% of baby boomers. And that's 2019 statistics. So peer-to-peer -peer, uh, giving was up one third. So it was up 33% year over year. So this is certainly on the rise, certainly something that uh, your nonprofit should be in, in investigating. And so uh, first things first on here on the slide is find the right, the right platform. A quick Google search with, you know, what are the best uh, P2P fundraising platforms? You're going to have to uh, find what is right for your budget. What do you think um, works best for your team? Uh, what gives the best? It makes the campaign um, pages for for the individual givers. And so some pages are more, may not fit your brand. It, it may be too far out there. You can't really edit a campaign page. So it, it may not fit your brand voice or tone or branding uh, guidelines. And so there's a lot of things to consider, but some research on your own, uh, finding the right, right platform isn't too difficult. And then you have to identify lead HR. So select a team internally that's going to uh, make the campaigns decide if it's going to be uh, individual campaigns are we going to target millennials are we going to target gen xers are we going to target boomers and what are we trying to accomplish here and then uh you know what's our budget too because some platforms ask for a different percent than another and then ask you know how are we going to ask for their pledge is this going to be on social media and email marketing are we going to put a banner on our home page for this uh campaign and really track that there's going to be a data section in the presentation today on on how to track things and so even if you wanted to take a small um moment of time so you you talk to the leadership and say hey peer-to-peer -peer campaign is up one third over last year 80 percent of millennial uh, excuse me 90 percent of millennials 90 percent of gen xers and 80 percent of baby boomers said they're willing to fundraise for us so we want to get together a small team and give this a test case we're going to use this campaign for our, excuse me we're going to use peer-to-peer -peer funding for this campaign so an example is that goodwill if that uh, job hashtag was a campaign they could have used peer-to-peer -peer funding for that as an example so personas before value proposition so just to to recap what we've talked about we've talked about uh positioning statements peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and now we're shifting into pers personas before value proposition so before you can um make any campaigns let alone peer-to-peer -peer, uh fundraising campaigns you have to define who your personas are so what is a persona a persona is a semi-fictional representation of your ideal constituent it, fundraisers your event participants your volunteers your members and your advocates so these are based on market research and real data you collect about your existing potential supporters Donor personas describe attributes of people your organization expects to interface with and can serve different verticals within your organization. So this is 2019 uh, giving, giving report there, and you could see that 69% uh, was given by individuals, that's up 4.7%. 17% was uh, foundations, that's up 2.5%. Uh, they got given by corporations was up 13%. And then you could see on the right hand side uh, what the money was given to religious, education, human services, foundations, et cetera. You all will have access to the slides, so you don't have to memorize the giving reports, but this is good information to have. And I think it helps you identify your organization's personas if you have it. The majority of nonprofits I work with have not done any real uh, persona work, it's all anecdotal. 
And if they, the limited data they do have, they're like, okay, I think this is the people that give, that give us money, but they have no hard, um, no hard data. So we're gonna get into, we're going that direction. So, you know, step number one, as far as persona is ad identify a primary persona. So in this example, uh, you, you, you may be the individual donor because you identified that giving's up for 4.7 percent and that's almost 70 percent of giving is done by individuals let's just say that your organization for um you know q through q4 2020 is going to uh really go after the individual donors and so that's let's just say that so let's start with interviews so your existing donors they've already supported your cause and engaged with your organization so you want to reach out to a variety of one-time donors, reoccurring donors, and large gift donors in your interviews. And some are likely to exemplify your perfect donor or uncover a possible segmentation miss that you missed in your persona work. So in the interviews, you wanna to get to know what inspires them. So when you're doing that, you know, hey, what inspires you to support a cause or organization? And, and this person would you know, give you an answer. And then define how each person persona gives and for what reason and be sure to be clear when you reach out to these individuals that you're looking for feedback not soliciting donations and will keep their personal information com completely uh, private so hopefully you have a crm a customer relations management system whether that's uh, salesforce or uh, mailchimp or hubspot or you know whatever your platform of choice is and then you segmented somehow you segment um donors and you have that so you have the information your the by email address uh of who your donors are and so i suggest um writing out an email and then re reaching reaching out and that you're looking for feedback and say yeah we're looking for feedback thank you for giving would you be uh you know able to do a five minute ten minute interview so you could either uh, do zoom now um obviously or, or through email before you know in person was a great way to do that i know in the current climate they may not be um, that may not be possible, but you want to do that to get data to really go over who your personas are. And I'm going back here. So, you know, that may be your going back a couple slides here. So, you know, you may interview fundraisers, you may interview event participants, you may interview volunteers, members, advocates, um, the donors that give a certain amount of gifts. You know, you have 20% of your um, large donors, and you may want to separate them. So really segmenting your personas is important. So uh, the components of a persona. So something catchy, I like, you know, donor Dolores or donor Dave, et cetera. Use a real picture. Um, the background there is basic details about the person's occupations, relevant background info, like education or hobby, hobbies, demographics, gender, age, household income, urbanicity, their goals. Um, their, their primary goals as a person, you know, why do they give and what are their goals and what are their secondary goals? The challenges, so any challenges they may, uh, they may face and primary and secondary about why, so in your interview, say, you know, what, why do you give to, you know, why do you give to the San Diego Zip? Well, because, you know, I care about animals and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are some barriers to you giving? Well, some barriers are X, Y, and Z, and you're just documenting that feedback. And then the last is, um, you know, uh, how can your organization help? And so you could you could solve their uh, challenges and you could help them achieve your goals. And so if your feedback says, you know, there's really barrier to giving now because of the current climate, and that should, could be more ammunition for you to share with your leadership about why you need more um, investment in marketing, more investment in peer-to-peer -peer, peer fundraising, uh, digital campaigns, and more marketing in Google AdWords or or email marketing campaigns or investment in a CRM because you don't have one. So there's an example of this interview process. And to be honest with you, a secondary um, benefit of doing these interviews is it gives you a chance to reach out to your donors again and that's not soliciting donations. And so it is a warm touch. They get to talk to you again, like, hey, Pearl, haven't talked to you in a while. Thank you so much for uh, being part of our interview. We're really wanting to get to know our donors uh, better and I just have some questions uh, you know questions for you you know first of all you know what are your goals and you know why do you give and just and just get into it and then you, you you can google what are some great interview questions to ask your donors and 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 make your own checklist make your own questionnaire and then you can make it specific by 
by um, generation. So whether millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers get a different questionnaire, or you could give it by giving amount. So if they're if they give under X amount of dollars, your questions are going to be this. If they give over X amount of dollars, their questions are going to be that. You could also separate them by staff member. If you have a staff member that's more um, accustomed to talking to large gifts or getting large gifts, or they have relationship with your large gift donors, then you might want to have them do the interview for a couple of reasons. One, they'll just, you know, not be nervous while doing it. And number two, it'll really be a high touch, warm, uh, warm way to reach out to them again. And like I said, that's really a good secondary byproduct of doing the interviews is that you get to talk to them again and you're not, it's not a solicitation. So now we'll move into data, which is my favorite. So the power of data. So we have predictive mo modeling, which enables uh, donor segmentation and engage opportunity identifications. We have reporting software, allows you to retrieve information from a donor database. Before I get into this, um, you know, the polling question could have been a lot of things. Do you have any data analytics software? Do you have, have you done uh, donor pers or personas? Have you done any interviews before? Um, but, I, but I pretty much know from the sample audience we get, you know, the answers that are going to come. And the answer is that we do a little bit of data gathering, but it's a lot of anecdotal. So if you don't have software, a quick Google search of the, the best reporting software of 2020 for nonprofits, go ahead and do some research and then just like your p2p fundraising campaign i can't recommend because it's different for each organization you have a different budget you have different um, staff to do that you may be wearing six hats right now um, and you may not have time to be the data anal uh, analyst for your organization and so i'm really um, empathetic to that so my favorite part of the presentation is coming up where i teach you the simplest low-hanging fruit to get data I, I wanted to state the fact that I understand you may not have predicted modeling, you may not have re reporting software, and that's and that's normal. Um, I do recommend that in this webinar today, um, you know, whoever you're speaking to, the decision maker, or you're the decision maker, we learned that you know data is really important. There's two things I think we're missing. I think we're missing uh, a robust uh, CRM, a customer relationship management system because we can't segment our donors very well. I'm doing it in an Excel spreadsheet right now, and my time could be better used somewhere else. So can we get budget for that? And number two, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna research reporting software. And so the two things that, you know, you're asking me what I learned from the webinar today, those are the two things that I really think that could help our organization. So there's an example of how this might be helpful to you if you don't have software. Um, obviously, data uh, analysis is a process of extracting, compiling, and modeling raw data for the purpose of obtaining constructive information. And you know, you got to define which matters number, or excuse me, which numbers matter to you most. Uh, usually, you know, total revenue year over year is an important metric. So you would survey at least three years of data. You'd calculate the percentage change over each fiscal year, and then you could ask questions like what changes uh, inspired the YOI shifts, what resources were used to increase giving, and is there a significant return on investment made? Another metric you could ask on the right side of the slide there is total revenue by source. So you could track each donation by source, so individuals, corporate foundations, etc. You could track the percent, percent change over each year. And then ask yourself questions, where is the fundraising program excelling or trailing? Are certain relationships inspiring gifts from new sources? Example, individual donor with a business connection. Some other metrics you could ask yourself is um, total number of donors. So is your total number of active supporters increasing or decreasing over the remaining or, or remaining uh, stagnant? You could segment, segment them by new, repeat, reactivated donors. And then total number of gifts, so you could track each donation by source, uh, new repeat reactivated, and then uh, corporate foundations, etc. Under the total number of gift, gifts. And the last slide about numbers is you might want to track the average gift size, so you could remove the outlier gifts, and it helps you accurately assess the average gift size. So calculate the percentage change over each uh, fiscal year. And then an outlier note is gifts that are not anticipated and are significantly larger than previous fiscal averages and then uh, top 20 donors. So 80% of the gifts generally comes from 20% of supporters. That's true, so major, major gifts, as you know already, they matter. And add up the top gifts across all sources and events and compare this list each year. 
So you can tell how having this data would help you inform your personas and help you inform your interviews. If you already know that 80% of your gifts come from your 20% of supporters, then you would know that those 20% of supporters is a persona. That might be your number one persona that you want to pay attention to. And so uh, I'll give you an example. If 80% of your gifts are coming from a certain segment, then I would highly strongly recommend that your email marketing campaigns are, are, are speaking to those people. Your website is speaking to those people. Your social media is speaking to those people. That's where they're at. I, I really see uh, a lot of nonprofits um, don't have a consistent voice or tone or messaging across uh, email marketing website and social media. And feel free to ask me specific questions about that. I've been instructed firmly to end on time and, and leave 20 minutes for questions. So please do um, write down questions that are specific to your nonprofit because we do have a lot of time uh, for that. And so um, if you're like, hey, Francisco, that you know, we, our money comes from here, but those people aren't on social media. And I, and I heard you say you wanted that to be the same. So how would you recommend I pivot there? That might be a question you want to ask. Let's get into the fun stuff. So if majority of nonprofits I train do not have data uh, analysis or metrics, they don't have a, a, data, a data analyst, number one, and they don't have any software, number two, some low hanging fruit there is Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is free and it can be downloaded and installed in under 15 minutes. So all you have to do is Google how to install Google Analytics into your website. So you can either do it if you have access, backend access to your WordPress or wherever your website was built. And if you don't, you could just, it has instructions that you just email to your web developer. It is seriously, seriously easy. Um, I will show you all a tool after this that is life changing um, to teach you how to do anything you want including uh, google analytics so um let's talk let's talk about google analytics it's my favorite tool i've been i've been doing this for a long time it's the easiest tool i think that if you if you're not in google analytics and you don't know how to use google analytics and you don't even know if your nonprofit has google analytics that's you know what it, from the web webinar i strongly strongly suggest you do that and you're going to find out why here in a second so step one is select as far as data analysis is to select a desired date range. So you'll see right here on the top, on the top right, you select, select a, a desired date range. We got Jan 1, 2019 over March 31, 2019. As an example there, number two, quick, a, quick acquisition overview, and then focus on top channels. So as soon as you get, do those steps, um, date range, acquisition overview, top channels, it's going to give you what's on the slide right now, your organic uh, search, your direct traffic, your social and referrals. So organic search is how many people are finding you in Google. I say Google because I know Bing is a thing and uh, there's other web browsers, but Google is something ridiculous, like 80% uh, and over of all traffic comes from Google. So for all intents and purposes, that's when I, when I see, organic search I'm, I'm thinking google now google analytics does break it down to where it came from if it came from bing or uh safari or google it'll break it down for you but you know like i said for all intents and purposes that's that's google so organic search what percent of your traffic came from people searching in that in that search bar of their search engine so the google search bar the, the next one direct traffic is the url that people type directly or reach for the, uh, via their browser and so on the top left they typed in www.goodwill.org they physically typed it in the URL so I'll give it I'll give an example you spent eight thousand dollars a month on a billboard and you're saying Francisco I don't know how to track you know if that if that billboard worked and how do you track branding you know we had a commercial go out we had a billboard go out how do we track branding one of the top metrics for branding increase is direct traffic how many people recognize your nonprofit's name and by by getting the delta the difference in web traffic q1 this year over q1 last year or if your billboard went up in the month of june you know may over june or june over july etc how many people typed in www.goodwill.org into the url is what direct traffic means and so it is a direct representation of branding the next metric there is social so how many people came from social media and it'll break uh, on the next slide, I'll show you, it'll break down there, uh, like 
what social channel, whether it's Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and then referral. And it'll tell you where referral traffic is sources outside of the search engine. Normally referral traffic is other websites that link to you. So hopefully you have a blog. And if, if, when you have a blog, other people will link to your blog posts, other websites. And Google really ranks, uh, really weighs that highly uh, other people linking to your site. That means you're relevant for, for whatever you're trying to be relevant for. So uh, San Diego Zoo, you know, animal wel welfare, et cetera, et cetera or Goodwill, whatever your nonprofit wants to be known for, people linking to your blog posts is going to help Google understand that you are relevant for that and, and it's gonna show you on the search engine results pages, page one hopefully more often than not. So once again, we're talking about Google Analytics. All you have to do is date range, acquisition overview, top channels. It's gonna give you, uh, it's gonna give you those, what you're looking at on your, on the slide there. Next one is to take note of acquisition numbers. So there's the direct organic social referral numbers on a website. So you have 10,800 10, users, 7,000 was direct, 2,100 was organic, 1,400 was social, and 183 is referral. So most of the people that, what, 70% of all their traffic is people typing in the URL in the top left. And so that pe people know who they are, but they're not getting any tra uh, traffic of people that don't know who they are. So you can compare desired date ranges. So up here at the top, it says Jan 1, 2019 uh, oh, through March compared to October and December. So that's Q4 2018 over Q1 2019. So you can do any date ranges that you want. You could do, if you ran a social media campaign for two weeks, you can go this two weeks over last two weeks, if you want to do year over year, because somebody's asking, your leadership is asking you how COVID has affected uh, your website traffic or online giving or online donations or you know hits to this page or that page, you can quickly um, give them the data by doing that. And what I love about this is it gives you the percentage. So you don't have to be a mathematician, but like, hey, Francisco, what was our traffic Q, Q4, uh, Q1 this year over Q4 last year? I'm talking about 30 seconds. Click, 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 and then I'm like, okay. And you can either cut, you know, screenshot this and, and slack that or put that in email, or you could just put those four bullet points in email, direct organic social referral, and then just give them uh, the percentages 85, 5.2, 114, and 40%. So in this example here, you know, we had an 85% increase in direct traffic. What do we do different from branding? So an example, they had a PR push, a public relations push, and they were featured in a couple online magazines. And that's the only difference they did in marketing Q1 over Q4. And so that showed because it, they had a direct traffic increase of 85%, people understanding who their brand was. They pushed those PR pieces out on social media. So that's a social increase of 114.44%. Uh, so there's, there's an example of what they were trying to track in that example. Step six is to click on sources and take a deeper dive. So you could actually click on social right here. So you click on it, it'll take you into Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and it'll give you those percentages. So, so a lot of people ask me, Francisco, there's a lot of social channels. There's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's Facebook, there's, there's Twitter, there's, or I think I already said that, there's Pinterest, there's Snapchat, there's, uh, you know, whatever. You know, do we need to be on everything? Um, uh, uh, who's your personas? Like, who are your major givers? If your major givers are millennials, then I think we need to have an Instagram conversation. If the majority of your givers are boomers, then I think we could go ahead and not do Instagram. But let's talk about what you're currently going on right now. Well, we're doing Twitter and been doing Twitter for six months, but we're not sure if it's worth our time. You, in 45 seconds, you can have that answer. Well, it went up 33%. Okay, I understand the 33% number, but we're talking about nine to 12. That's not worth the social media administrator's time, or we don't even have a social media person. Currently our director of development is doing our social media and they don't need to be tweeting all day. So there's an example of how that data could help you save somebody's time. You could take a hat off of somebody's head, or at least you could decrease the weight of that hat. That hat being a social media administrator you know, that somebody else is wearing, you'd be like, okay, I, 
thank you for doing Facebook. Thank you for doing LinkedIn. We're going to go ahead and not do Instagram and Twitter. We'll revisit that next calendar year, but we appreciate your efforts. Um, we might take away LinkedIn because it looks like us going from 12 to 13 clicks to the website is barely worth it, but um, a, a lot of boomers and Gen Xers are on LinkedIn, so we want to give it a fair shake, and you know the boss wants to keep us going for a year. So I mean, you could have conversations about that. Facebook's not even you know not even worth discussing because it was up 118 percent. So you went from 635 clicks uh, Q4 over uh, 1389 clicks over the last year. So there's an example of why the data is important. So um, step seven is ask questions. So our impressions on social markedly increased Q1 uh, 29. Did we do anything that accounts for increase in organic search? And the answer was yes, we did uh, PR. So direct traffic markedly increased. What branding activities do the organization conduct that might have contributed? What can we conservatively attribute to social media? And then define what's important to your organization, then track and report, especially with COVID going on, if a lot of nonprofits are struggling, they'll obviously automatically blame it uh, on COVID, and maybe rightfully so. It's, they can't do it in person. They can't have the high touch. There's not as many um, dinners that are happening. There's not as many in-person fundraising. You know, a lot of this is high touch. Um, you need to see the smile. Like, I'm really frustrated that you guys can't see them on camera because, I mean, the same reasons. Like, you can't see the smile. You can't see the... Um, you can hear the tone, but you can't see it. I use my hands, et cetera, and I really get some points across that I can't get without a camera. So I'm sure the same uh, same um, issues are rearing their heads in the nonprofit uh, realm. But if you have Google Analytics, you can quickly see, at least online, what's happening. It's, well, I know that we can't do it, but website traffic has went up 600% over last year because everybody's at home and everybody on their computers, it looks like they're really at least, at least um, making their way to our website. Now they're not giving and we need to fix that. So um, yeah, so I do have one second and I, I, to I told you that I would show you a tool and I will. So I am going to, oh please. This is Udemy, it's my favorite tool. So I got my undergrad at National University in business and I had my I got my MBA in marketing at uh, National University as well. And you know Snapchat ads weren't a thing and TikTok wasn't even invented yet. And people asked me, Francisco, you know, where did you learn how to do this? Or I don't, you know, I'm not tech savvy or I'm not sure data analytics isn't my thing or Microsoft Excel and I don't know what a pivot table is and whatever you want to learn is on Udemy. So an example of not knowing Google Analytics, you can go to Google Analytics in Udemy, and that's udemy.com. In Udemy, click it, and this is for nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. You can get a well-vetted ten thousand reviews on this course and become. You don't have to get certified, but you become a master at Google Analytics. If you're like Francisco, you know we really want to get better at social media, but we don't know how to do, I heard Facebook will let you do ads by income. So our nonprofit helps homeless people in San Diego and we wanna run ads to people that identify as philanthropists that live within 25 miles of the city of, of this zip code in San Diego that make over $2 million a year that, have a, that are interested in homelessness and helping veterans and I heard you could do that on Facebook. I would tell you, you heard right. And you're, you would say, I don't know how to run ads. I would say I didn't know how to ride a, you know, I didn't know how to ride a bike, but I learned. I would say I didn't learn how to run Facebook ads in my in my marketing co courses over the years. I learned how to run Facebook ads from Udemy. So this masterclass that was $140 cost $13.99. Um, and I can't, you know, I can't stress. I was the vice president of marketing for one of the largest agencies in the nation for four and a half years, and I learned how to run everything off of Udemy. So before Udemy existed, I had to go to YouTube and learn how to do it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to encourage you that whether grooming a dog's on here too, whatever you want, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, LinkedIn ads, um, data analytics, whatever software you choose to go with for your for your data analytics, it'll be on here too. So if there's a tool that I could really encourage you, it's udemy.com, U-D-E-M-Y, and I will go back to our 
PowerPoint, and that leads us to questions. All right, we have some great questions coming in already. Um, first, someone asked if you could define organic search, and I thought if you could do that quickly in case anyone else had the same question. Sure. O organic search is people searching in your bar. So right here, um, right here, typing in um, San Diego Zoo is organic search. That's organic search right there. Great, thank you. All right, I will go to the next question. Let's see. So one, someone asked if we are catering to the 20%, providing 80% of donations, how do we attract new donors? And don't we want to expand our large giving base? Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so there's um, there's landing pages is the answer. And so if, you're, if your website is, I'm gonna use the San Diego Zoo as an example, and you're, you're speaking to um, the 80% there, but there's some, in your persona research, in your voice and tone research, you've decided that you want to attract different people, but maybe not edit your homepage. You can make landing pages. I really uh, recommend lead pages. And what that is, lead pages will, lead pages will make drag and drop, just drag, 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 drop. And you can make a page that looks like this, that isn't this. So it'll say lead, San Diego zoo.com forward slash lead pages. And you could, name it millennial and then rebrand it you know but you could track it in-house on what landing page that is and then you could run ads so to answer your question if you wanted more um millennials to your website you would make facebook ads targeted to millennials so only people are going to see it are millennials that make over uh, fifty thousand dollars a year that live within a hundred miles of your zip code that are interested in animal welfare and when they click on the ad instead of taking them to your website that speaks to other people you take them to this landing page and on there it says donate now i think charity water is a good example of landing pages is here boom so this there this is example of uh, right here, donate the spring UTM medium. This is a landing page. This isn't their homepage. It looks just like their homepage, but it's not their homepage. It's a landing page. So there's an example. They run ads. People click on it and they land on this page. And right here, they can donate monthly online giving. And so there's an example of how to do that. How to make lead pages is on here, Udemy. How to make Facebook ads to target people is on Udemy. And I really recommend you can make different variations of this page. You could try a different picture here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how you do that. Great. All right. Our next question here um, is what do you recommend for maintaining a consistent voice across the organization when the development, excuse me, when the development team is in charge of the annual fund, which involves mailing, e appeals, uh, giving campaigns? but the communications team is in charge of content for the website, social media, talking about programs and the overall mission. Oh man, that's a, that was a, um, a handful. I think that, oh, hold please. I think that I will show you this right here. So if you type in brand voice examples and click on images, Brand voice examples images. One of the best things I like to use is this is this bad boy right here. Um, it's from Fast Company, and like I said, brand voice examples, and then click images. It's the first one on your top left. And this, your persona. Once you define them, you could define their tone, define the purpose, define their language, and 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 you can say this is our social media voice, and you can give that to your development team. And then you could say this is our website voice and you can give that to your dev team. You could say, here's our email marketing and um, content. When I say content, I'm talking about blogs, uh, blog posts, email, web, uh, uh, mark, I'm not gonna say white papers because that's a little more professional, but your branding team, if, if, if there's no branding team and that's you, because you're the director of development and you know six other hats, um, I think that you can take 48 hours 
uh, using this as a resource and make make your one of these bad boys for social media, one of these bad boys for your uh, website, and then one of these bad boys for content, meaning email and blog posts, and and, and um, give that to your dev team, your content lead, and your social media lead, and just have them pin it, pin it uh, as their desktop background, or put it, frame it, put it on the wall, and just let them know that everything you do, if you could please reference this, and so we could all be on the same page. I think that's the easiest way I mean, there's software, but I think we're getting overkill here. I think that's the best way. And then it'll give you, the decision maker, a chance to do the exercise to really hone your uh, voice and tone. Great. All right. Next question. Someone asked if you can use Udemy to figure out how to do a landing page, too. Yes, please. Please, please, please. Um, yes. So, um, Landing pages. I really like um, lead pages for nonprofits, but ClickFunnels is also really, yeah. So landing page, no code, converting today. If you're using lead pages, lead pages, you could put a lead pages in there, and it'll it'll give you lead pages. If you use ClickFunnels, which is really cool but it's a little more um, salesy. Like if you're selling socks or something, you'd want to use ClickFunnels. So if you are you had an e-commerce side gig, <laughs> ClickFunnels beats lead pages, but um, I'm, a I'm a fan of uh, lead. It's cheap. I'm talking about like $49 a month to drag and drop. In all fairness, it's going to take you, I think, eight hours to watch the course, and it'll take you probably a real 10 hours of playing with it before you feel comfortable. So, you know, there's going to be 18 hours of you throwing your computer against a wall, but after that, um, it gets really fun, and you can build, you can build that in about four hours. Wonderful. All right. Next question: How do you encourage donors who hardly use technology to slowly shift to dig digital giving, which is especially relevant during the pandemic over direct mail? Yeah, landing pages. So. Um, I would make a landing page for a donor. If this was going to be the baby boomers, um, this picture may be a may be a boomer, for instance. And then if it's going to females, I would make the picture females. Study shows that that performs better. If it was going to males, I would make this a male. So you could have variations of this page. It was it's known as A/B testing, where you're testing A picture versus B picture. We're really talk. I'm talking about multivariate testing now. And so just keep a Google Doc and say. We ran ads to boomers to encourage them to donate online, and we send them to here. So you just cut and paste that, and you did that. And then those, that's the male version, and then the female version is this. And then you know maybe that's all you're doing because that's all you could handle right now, and also you're still learning. But you run ads to the boomers on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, so right here, LinkedIn ads. On LinkedIn, you run the ads to the boomers. The boomers go to this page that has a boomer and it says change the way you give or don't let technology be a barrier you know you could still support really play with the messaging i i know that this charity water is a great example of a high performing landing page so you don't need a lot of copy all you need is here and that to say don't let the current state of situations affect your impact or whatever from your interviews what's their pain point you're trying to fix for the boomers or it, let's just say we're going to boomers here and then they get they be able to give so the answer is you run ads to them when they click on the ad instead of going to the home page it goes to a landing page and then you do that argument is francisco if they were tech savvy then you know what what makes you think they're on what makes you think they're on linkedin so, I mean, you can, a quick Google search is who's on LinkedIn by generation. And then I think somebody would tell you that that was anecdotal and that there's 675 million users, 310 monthly active users, and it'll have 24% are millennials, 51% um, are college graduates. And then, you know, you, you can get into what social platform should I be on? But the answer to that question, if you're, you, I think that's where we're going, is that 
you know, they aren't on social media. I would say that's not true at all. They are, and then you could quickly um, find out that they are. So the answer is run ads to them on LinkedIn, send them to your page and have the call to action. The messaging be, um, you know, don't let technology be a barrier for impact, something like that. And then you could, once you get the picture and the page down, you can test four different variations of this sentence and which one gives the most. And if you don't know what a good conversion rate is, ask grandma, grandma's Google, ask grandma, what, what's a normal conversion rate for a landing page? 3% is the answer. What's a normal click-through rate? Like, you know, there's gonna be an education curve uh, of doing this. Now, if you have the budget, spend the 40K, 50K to get a social media administrator. If you don't have the budget, but you have time, take a Udemy course. And I think the in-between of the two is um, find an, uh, an intern or hire a consultant. All right, we have about one to two minutes left for questions. Uh, the next question we have is, would Facebook work the same as LinkedIn for getting donors who aren't tech savvy? Um, I would go back to Googling who's on Facebook, what generations are on Facebook, age groups, and what demographics age groups are on LinkedIn. And then, so the answer is no, you're gonna have an older, more professional group on LinkedIn, and you're gonna have uh, maybe even the same, on Facebook, but they're there for a different reason. You're on Facebook to connect with friends and family, and you're on LinkedIn to um, to network. And so maybe the answer is both. Your just ads say different thing. Your ad on LinkedIn is more professional about networking, and your ad on Facebook is more a little more collo colloquial. I don't know if that answered the question. I went a little off off topic there, but uh, it's I, I don't think it's an either or. If you if I had to choose. Um, I know LinkedIn ads are four more, four more times more expensive than Facebook. So if you've never done this before, let's test where it's cheaper. And the, the overlap is alarming, meaning like there's the people that are on LinkedIn are also on Facebook. So I don't think it's a big risk to start testing on Facebook first. I mean, that's my answer always. Test on Facebook first because it costs a quarter instead of a dollar. Um, and then once you get your ad honed in and you get good conversions, then do that same thing on LinkedIn so you're not wasting uh, wasting money testing. Great, and they did respond saying, saying yes, it did answer their question. Um, thank you so much to everyone for your questions and um, thanks for your patience with us as we navigated technology in this new virtual world. Uh, if you'd like to contact Francisco, his, web, his uh, email is on the page. And again, we will be sending the slide deck and recording out to everyone in the next week. So you will have a recording of the presentation as well as the Q&A and all of these slides. All right, hopefully we have left you wanting more. Our textbook, Cause Selling the Sanford Way, A Guide to Relationship-Driven Fundraising, um, can be accessed on causeselling.org. You can get a free first chapter and order the textbook or ebook on Amazon. Don't miss our next webinar, Going Virtual, Redesigning Your Next Fundraising Event and Campaign on September 16th. You will receive a link to register in the follow-up email. And again, we want to thank everyone for coming out today. We want to thank you for your time and participation. And thank you, Francisco, for the amazing presentation. To help us continue to improve our monthly webinar series and ensure that we're providing value to our audience, please take a few minutes to complete our survey. We hope you are all safe and healthy, that you enjoy the rest of your day. And we thank you for all you do to better the communities in which we live, work, and play. We'll see you on September 16th. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, everyone.